Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Flood News at Noon today. Our guest speakers today are our very own Glenn Mathers and Mike Dubose. Glenn came to CNC in the summer of 2011 with no experience, but with the ambitions of becoming an adjuster. After deciding to take as many CNC-sponsored classes as he could, he was recognized as an individual with great potential. Glenn took an intern role at the company and began to learn the everyday business of adjusting. Within a few weeks, he was offered a position as a file examiner. Along with his file examination duties, Glenn was interested in expanding his role and soon began to write supplements in-house. From there, he branched out to begin outside flood and auto adjusting, as well as maintaining his role as senior flood examiner. In January of 2017, Glenn was named the Flood Claims Manager for CNC and has overseen the settling of over 20,000 claims. In 2019, Glenn was certified to present the NFIP Flood Certification Course. And Mike Dubose. Mike Dubose is our Property QC and Flood a Field Adjuster Manager. He has worked with CNC in the field and is a QC Desk Adjuster for six years. Prior to this, he was working in the underwriting field. He enjoys the work that he does, and interacting with staff and field adjusters keeps work very interesting. His motto is, what does the deck page say? Mike's goal is to one day sail south. Please welcome Mike and Glenn. Today we're discussing wind versus flood. Let's begin with the basics and define flood and wind. Glenn, how would you define flood? Well the, well, the first thing I want to say is you've got to understand that when an insured has water in their house, they immediately think it's a flood. Now, anything water related to a policyholder, they think is flood, whether it's a hot water tank that bursts, uh, washer overflows, uh, anything that where they see water in, puddling in their house, they're going to call it a flood. But that is not the definition of a flood. Uh, under the uh, NFIP policy. So it has to meet a certain requirement to be considered a flood. Um, and that is the definition of a general condition of flooding, which is a general and temporary condition of partial or complete inundation of two or more acres um, of normally dry land. So there can also be, it can be two or more properties, one of which is yours. Um, but it has to meet that definition of a flood to be considered for coverage. And Mike, how would you define wind? Wind uh, is, of course, different from flood. You cannot see wind like you can see a flood line on a house. What you have to look for is the effects of wind, like missing or torn or creased shingles, um, a tree that fell on the house, uh, debris that struck the side of the house. So wind damage is generally, when it comes to water, is considered falling water, where flood is rising water. And what you have to look for with wind is the effects of that wind or the ensuing damage that occurred from what the wind did to the structure. Okay. If you will, give us an example where each of you have had a loss with both perils. Go ahead, Mike. Um, I particularly remember one that was one of our hurricane events, and the uh, house had uh, wind damage to the roof. There were actually sections of the sheathing on the roof that were blown off. Uh, so there was wind damage to the roof. However, when you walked into the house, there was a flood line within eight inches of the ceiling. And so what ended up happening was uh, wind covered the ceilings, but everything from that flood line down was considered flood or tidal surge. Okay. Yeah, we just had something uh, recently. We had a mobile home court that uh, had two different events happen. Uh, they, they had a wind event where it caused a lot of damage to the, to the exterior walls and the roofs and ceilings and uh, they had a, a wind adjuster go out there. He got all his, his stuff together but before he could give his reports 
they had a flood event. Now the flood event just got into the crawl space, um, but what happened was there were a lot of air conditioners that were up on platforms. Now the wind knocked them off of those platforms, um, but the, they may not have been completely destroyed just by being knocked off the platform. A lot of times you can pick them up, service call, and they're fine. But once they were on the ground, the flood water came in, uh, which was salt water. Yeah. How do we know? How do we know the flood didn't undermine those platforms? But yeah. He, well, I, he documented it before yes, the flood it, came in. So right. Good. Yeah, that was the interesting part of it is because the uh, because of the wind, the, the wind event was first. So we have photographs of them, you know, knocked over after the wind event. Um, but then when the flood water came in. Now they're, they're probably damaged by salt water, um, but we do have to wait for the wind adjuster to give his report because if he's gonna pay for those air conditioners, then we're not, we're not gonna uh, cover them. That'd be a duplication of coverage, so. Okay, that brings a question to mind. When wind does knock off a compressor, uh, knocks a compressor off its platform into flood water, who covers the damages? Service call. That's what I would do as a service call. <laughs> because we're, we want to make sure what the damage is. So, uh. <laughs> Well, you know that when the wind knocks it off the platform, mm -hmm. it's going to be pulling the, the different hoses and connections to the dwelling away and causing some damage. Now, what concerns me is when it strikes the ground, if the ground doesn't have water standing in it, it's going to damage the casing that that air conditioning unit is in. But is it damaged enough to keep it from being serviced and reused? Or if it, flood water comes in, it's laying on the ground, now the flood has caused more damage additional damage right but the initial damage was caused by it getting blown off the platform so basically the policyholder would need to have a service call and let the technician decide what damage caught i mean what caused the amount of uh, the damage how much was caused by wind and how much was caused by flood right okay all right a roof is missing with one inch flood line who covers the damages is the flood line on the outside of the house as well? Good. Or is the flood line just inside the house? Because you can have wind events that are associated with eight inches of rain that could actually cause that line along the bottom. But I want to see outside the house, was there rising water that inundated the structure from there? Because I could see, you know, in a really heavy rain event, rain getting in and pooling on the floor. But I do want to see the outside. So if you're out there inspecting that, I'm going to ask you for that picture. All right, and that goes with our next question. What are some basic clues of both perils that should stand out to the adjuster to cause him or her to investigate further. Glenn, what are some basic flood clues a wind adjuster should look for or that should stand out to them when they're in the field that may make them question if this is flood or not? Yeah, well, the first thing they should do is their canvas in the area is uh, looking to see what the damage is in the community. Like, like a lot of times, is the roof intact but the walls are missing? That's a big indicator of a flood event. Or you could see where the roof is gone and the walls are still there, and that would more indicate a, a wind event. So that, those are a couple of things you'd want to look at. Uh, if there's a boat sitting in the front yard, I'm going to question how high did this water get <laughs> when I'm coming through there? Or, you know, if you've got a surge line in the yard when you drive up and you notice that hey all this debris has been pushed up this far into the yard and I've got a house sitting here that's got 
you know, all the floors damaged and all the, all the damage seems to be down here along the baseboards and all your photos are oriented that way, I'm going to really question flood. Now, I'm still going to get on the roof. I'm going to look for lifted, creased, missing shingles. I'm going to look for uh, damage around the windows, the window screens, how much flying debris was going on around here. But when you drive up, you can normally tell pretty well that hey, there was flooding around here, or no, this was just a, a wind event that happened away from any flood waters or inundation from water. Okay. All right, Glenn, what should a flood adjuster do when he notices wind clues? What would be the proper procedure um, to start uh, to handle? Yeah, I get you. Because, uh, you know, as, as we go out there as a flood adjuster, that is our expertise. We're out there to, to determine uh, the flood damage, you know, and, and write an estimate for flood damage. We are not experts in other uh, perils. Uh, but the one thing that a flood adjuster always needs to do is look at, look at the ceilings, look for indications of damage that may have come from something else. But we are not the expert to say what it is from. We just want to, to point it out like ceiling damage and say there, you know, there's a stain in the ceiling which was caused by a peril other than flood. Okay. So we want to make sure that we're indicating that there's other damage, but we're not going to make that determination as to what it is. And Mike, what should a wind adjuster do? What's the proper procedure for him? Pretty much the same if, if he finds that yeah. there is flood where it seems yeah, to be. Yeah, you want to document the flood damage or what you're seeing as flood uh, and identify, you know, not this damage uh, stem from rising water um, and then the things like the ceiling water damage, you know, of course you've got to document that because that's going to be part of the wind claim because the water was falling, it wasn't rising. And then, of course, you've got to do, you know, a roof examination and look for where, how that water got into the house and, uh, you know, the different indicators, like I said, a tree that fell on the side of the house. It's, it's pretty, you know, right. evident that wind knocked the tree over. Now, I guess you could have a, a flood knock a tree over and not have any real wind damage. Yeah, we have seen but that. Yeah, there. yeah, where the force of the, the way the water pushes the tree over. Mm -hmm. That's true. And there's no other wind damage, but I got flood damage and I'm thinking, how did this tree get on the side of this house? Okay. How does it affect the claim and the policy holder? How does documenting all this affect them? Uh, well, wind doesn't have any coverage for flood it's normally excluded in the policy because flood policies are a totally separate policy. So the, the rising water flood, and, and Glenn gave a very good definition of what flood is, wind doesn't cover that. So I've got to differentiate between what was caused by wind and what was the ensuing damage from that wind damage that my wind policy covers for. And Glenn, how do you think this would affect the policyholder? Yeah, I mean, like he says, it, it's so important that we both um, take care of what our policies cover so that the, uh, the insured is made as whole as absolutely possible. Um, and, and that entails us working together um, to make sure that we're, we're covering what we can cover. Okay, when handled properly, what can be avoided? Duplications. Duplications of coverage. Um, I mean, like it's it's funny. Most property adjusters they they always look top down, and we look from the from the ground up. Um, so most of a lot of times we can if we've got damage to both ceiling and roofs, and then the floor that we've determined as flood. Um, you know, we the the flood adjuster may cover the floor and four feet of the drywall, the lower four feet, and then 
The wind adjuster may come in and handle the ceiling and the upper four feet of drywall. Maybe you're going to cover that door too because it got damaged at the bottom. I, yep, that would probably be, we would probably handle the door. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how it, how is the wind adjuster and flood adjuster working together from the beginning beneficial? How are they beneficial to each other, the policyholder, and why? They're beneficial to each other because as you discuss the damages that you're seeing. Uh, you can write for the part that, that fairly is owed for by the policy that you're writing coverage for. And then for, for the policy holder, the, the good part about working together is that you get the claim done faster. It's not, well, I don't know why you covered these floors, that was flood, you've got to rewrite your estimate, send it back, and undo all, you know, if you, if you have a pretty good working relationship in the beginning, your estimate's going to be written pretty clean and you're not going to be going back and forth for a lot of revisions of, hey, you got to take this out, you got to put this in. So it helps the policyholder because it expedites the settlement of the claim. And they need their money. Absolutely, it's communication. If, if you've got an open communication, with the other adjuster from the beginning and you're, you're, you're both you know talking about hey this is damage that that I think that that we're responsible for and the flood adjuster saying this is what we're responsible for you're going to uh, you're going to create two good estimates um, and you're going to have a, a happy insured right from the beginning mm -hmm. I mean okay and at the end of the day when you have more than one peril what do you need an engineer. an engineer. I mean, an engineer, the one thing, especially on the flood side, there, there are so many things that can happen that we're not qualified to make a determination of what the exact cause is. I mean, we're out there to document flood damage um, and then to report any damages that the insured tells us about. We have an engineer that can come out and tell us exactly what has happened and then we apply our policy to uh, their determination. Yeah, you go out and you see the side of a house missing. Did wind blow it off or did flood push it off? Uh, an engineer can determine that with a certainty that if, you know, if it gets called into question, say the person doesn't have flood insurance and they really want that to be wind, the engineer can determine fairly and equitably for both the insured and the insurer that this was caused by flood or this was caused by wind and this should be written for under this policy or it should not. But that an engineer in those places where it's questionable, you can't really determine with a great certainty that this is what caused it. An engineer gives you that, you know, backup and that determination that the, this is a result of wind or flood. And that, that really helps you and, you know, the policyholder and the insurer to know that we've done this correctly. Very good. Well, guys, I want to thank you for being here and discussing this with us today. Do either of you have any last comments or things you'd like to say or advice you'd like to give to our adjusters, maybe starting out, or even people who've been in the field a while but haven't had a lot of, um, haven't encountered multiple perils in their career? The one thing I would say is to take every opportunity uh, that, that the firm that you're working with uh, offers you. Uh, don't don't just pigeonhole yourself as a flood adjuster or a property adjuster. Learn everything that you can, um, so that so that you've always got work. You know. You know. I would tell them document. Take those photos. Make sure you're explaining in your photos what it is you observe because your photos are not always as clear to us as they are to you standing there. 
but you can give us the story, what you saw, what you know led you to this conclusion or this uh, decision, um, and to don't shortchange people. You're already out there. Do what needs to be done. Do it thoroughly, because otherwise you'll earn a free trip back. 